The Gods of Nibiru in the Ancient Near East Anunnaki History, Sumerian Philosophy and the Cosmology of Man Written by Ryan Morhen In the 3rd millennium BC, the Anunnaki Sumerians failed to develop a systematic philosophy in the accepted sense. Neither of them considered the nature of reality or knowledge to be fundamental. They strengthened virtually nothing corresponding to the philosophical subdivision known today as epistemology. However, they speculated about nature and how the universe originated and works. Some Sumerian thinkers and teachers emerged in their efforts to find satisfactory answers to some of their cosmic speculations. In the ancient Near East, their doctrines became the fundamental creed and dogma for much of its cosmology and religion. These main cosmological ideas and theological speculations are nowhere explicitly stated in philosophical terms and periodic statements. The Sumerian philosophers failed to discover the all-important intellectual tools we take for granted today. The scientific method of Anunnaki definition and generalization, without which our modern science would never have thrived. While the Sumerian thinker was fully aware of countless concrete examples of cause and effect, he never planned it as a general, all-pervading law. Sumerian myths, epic tales and hymns contain much of our knowledge about Sumerian philosophy, theology, cosmology and cosmogony. Teachers and sages of Sumeria considered heaven and earth the two most significant elements of the universe. Indeed, their term for the universe was Anki, a compound word meaning heaven, earth. They believed the Earth to be a residential resort for Nibiru, heaven, a hollow space encircled at the top and bottom by a solid surface in the shape of a vault. There is still uncertainty about what this heavenly solid was. According to their philosophical speculations, what were some of the scientific data they had at their disposal that supported their assumptions? From the fact that the Sumerian phrase for tin is metal of heaven, it may have been tin. Heaven and earth coexisted with a substance called lil, roughly equivalent to wind, air, breath, spirit. Its most essential characteristics seem to be movement and expansion, making it roughly equivalent to the atmosphere we experience on earth. The sun, moon, planets and stars were made of the same atmosphere, but luminous in ancient times. The heaven earth was surrounded and at top and bottom by the boundless sea, in which the universe somehow remained fixed and immovable. They developed a cosmogony to fit the fundamental assumptions about the universe's structure, which seemed clear and indisputable to Sumerian thinkers. The first they concluded was the primeval sea. The indications are that they viewed the sea as a kind of primary cause and prime mover. They never asked themselves what came before the sea in time and space. Somehow, this primeval sea spawned the universe, the heaven-earth, composed of a vaulted heaven superimposed over the earth and united. Heaven and earth were separated by a moving and expanding atmosphere. Out of this atmosphere arose the luminous bodies, the moon, sun, planets and stars. When heaven and earth separated and astral bodies were created, plant, animal and human life took shape. Throughout the ages, who designed and maintained this universe? Throughout Sumerian history, it has been assumed that a pantheon exists composed of a group of living creatures, human in form but superhuman and immortal, who, despite being invisible to the mortal eye, governs the cosmos following well-designed plans and laws. A being or beings controlled the fantastic realms of heaven and earth, sea and air, 
The major astral bodies, the sun, moon and planet, atmospheric forces such as wind, storm and tempest, and within the Earth's domain, natural entities such as a river, mountain and plain, cultural entities such as a city, state, ditch or field, and even implements such as the pickaxe, brick mould and plough. Superhuman beings were to guide the activities of a particular compound of the universe following rules and regulations. Lands and cities, palaces and temples, farms and fields, in short, all conceivable institutions and enterprises are tended and managed, guided and controlled by living human beings, without whom lands and cities become desolate, temples and palaces crumble, and fields and farms become deserts and wildernesses. Assuming these human-like beings could not be seen by the Sumerian theologians, this axiomatic assumption lays the foundation for logical inference. They followed the path of human society as they knew it, reasoning their way from the known to the unknown. Because the cosmos is a far more extensive area than the total number of human habitations, and its organization is much more complicated, these living beings must be much more robust and effective than ordinary humans. Consequently, living beings in humans must also tend and supervise, guide and control the cosmos and its multiplicity of phenomena. They all must be invisible, anthropomorphic, yet powerful and immortal beings that the Sumerian described by his word Dinga, which we interpret as God. Above all, they must all be immortal. The cosmos would collapse upon their death, and the world would end, alternatives to which the Sumerian metaphysician did not recommend. What was the function of this divine pantheon? For starters, it was reasonable for the Sumerians to assume that the gods making up the pantheon were not equally important or ranked. One could hardly compare the god responsible for pickaxes or brick moulds with the god responsible for the sun. It is impossible to expect the god responsible for dikes and ditches to rank the god responsible for earth equally. As in the political organisation of the human state, it was also natural to presume that the chief of the pantheon was a god acknowledged by all as king and ruler. Consequently, the Sumerian pantheon was thought of as an assembly with a king at its head, and its most essential groups included seven gods who decide fates, and fifty known as the great gods. Because of their cosmological views, the Sumerian theologians divided creative and non-creative gods within their pantheon, the essential components of the universe were, in their view, heaven and earth, sea and atmosphere. All other cosmic phenomena could only exist within one or more of these realms. As a result, it seemed reasonable to conclude that one or more of the four gods controlling heaven, earth, sea and air were the creators and that one of these four also created everything else in the universe. According to Sumerian philosophers, these deities were created by using the divine word, a doctrine that became dogma throughout the Near East. According to this doctrine, the deity who created the world only lay his plans, spoke the word, and pronounced the name. Observing human society led to an analogical inference about the creative power of the divine world. In the four realms of the universe, the immortal and superhuman deities in charge could accomplish much more than a human monarch could by commanding. There is a reason why this easy solution to the cosmological problems, in which thought and word alone are so crucial, reflects the wish-fulfillment characteristic of all humans during times of stress and misfortune. For similar reasons, the Sumerian theologians arrived at a satisfying metaphysical inference to explain how cosmic entities and cultural phenomena, once created, will function continuously and harmoniously without conflict and confusion. This is the concept signified by the Sumerian word me, whose exact meaning is still obscure. This would show a set of rules or regulations assigned to each cosmic entity and cultural phenomenon to keep them operating according to the plans laid down by the deities who created them. This superficial but not entirely useless response obscured the fundamental difficulties by layering a layer of meaningless words on top of an insoluble cosmological problem. Sumerian intellectuals did not develop a literary genre comparable to a systematic treatment of their philosophical, cosmological and theological concepts. Scholars today are compelled to dig out these concepts from among the many myths that have been recovered to date, whole or in part. It is also no simple task because the myth-makers and myth-writers 
must not confuse the metaphysician and theologian. Although often they are combined in the same person, psychologically and temperamentally they are poles apart. Scribes and poets glorified and exalted the gods and their deeds among the mythographers. Unlike philosophers, they had no interest in discovering cosmological or theological truths. Rather than worrying about their origins and development, they accepted the current theological notions and practices. To be appealing, inspiring and entertaining, the mythmakers aimed to compose a narrative poem explaining one or more of these notions and practices. Arguments and proofs aimed at the intellect were unimportant to them. Their first concern was to tell a story that appealed to the emotions. They used imagination and fantasy rather than logic and reason as their main literary tools. These poets did not hesitate to make up motives and incidents, modelled after human actions, which could not conceivably have any basis in reasonable and speculative thought. In addition, they did not hesitate to use mythological and folkloristic motifs that had nothing to do with cosmological inquiry and inference. Students of ancient Oriental thought, primarily those influenced by the current demands for salvation rather than truth, have been confused by failing to distinguish between Sumerian mythographers and philosophers, leading them to underestimate and overestimate ancient minds. First, they argued that the ancients could not think logically and intelligently about cosmic problems. The ancients were endowed with an intellectually unspoiled, mythopoeic mind, which was naturally intuitive and profound, and could perceive cosmic truths far more deeply than the modern mind with its analytical and intellectual approach. These are mostly just nonsense and useless information. A Sumerian thinker of more maturity and reflection could think logically and coherently on any topic, including the origins and operations of the universe. The principle of evolution, which seems apparent nowadays, was unfamiliar to him since he lacked such fundamental conceptual tools as definitions and generalizations. He ran into problems because there was no scientific data available. Unlike the Sumerian philosopher, he was sure that his thoughts on the matter were correct and that he understood precisely how the universe was created and operated. The difference is that modern thinking man is prepared to admit the relative nature of their conclusions and is sceptical of all absolute answers. I am sure that in some future day, with the accumulation of new data and the discovery of hitherto unimagined intellectual tools and perspectives, the limitations and shortcomings of the philosophers and scientists of today will become apparent. What does the Sumerian conception of the creation of the universe look like? Gilgamesh, Enkidu and the Netherworld is the primary source. The story does not involve itself with the poem itself, but with the introduction. The Sumerian poets usually started their myths or epic poems with a cosmological statement that had no direct bearing on the poem. This prologue to Gilgamesh, Enkidu and Netherworld comprises the following five lines. When heaven was removed from the earth, following the separation of the earth from heaven, as soon as the man's name was determined, and carried off the heaven after the heaven god, and carried off the heaven. Enlil, the air god, carried the earth off. Heaven and earth were once united. The translation of these lines led me to analyze them and deduce the following cosmogonic concepts. The first is, the second, before heaven and earth separated, there were some gods. Three, when heaven and earth were separated, the heaven god and carried off heaven, but the air god Enlil carried off earth. This passage omits or implies several key points. First, when and by whom were heaven and earth conceived as created? The second paragraph, as conceived by the Sumerians, how did heaven and earth look? Three, from where did heaven separate from earth? Sumerian texts provide the following answers to these three questions. The first is, in a tablet listing the Sumerian gods, the goddess Namu, depicted with the pictogram for primeval sea, is described as the mother who gave birth to heaven and earth. The Sumerians therefore conceived heaven and earth as the result of the primeval sea. Second, the cattle and grain myth begins with these two lines. Cattle and grain were born in heaven and were sent down to earth to contribute to the prosperity of mankind. See chapter 14. The mountain of heaven and earth. The Anunnaki were created by A. Three, the following passage introduces a poem about the creation and dedication of the pickaxe, the valuable agricultural implement. For the sake of bringing forth what is helpful, the Lord whose decisions cannot be changed. Enlil brings up the seed of the land from the earth, 
who planned to move away from heaven, the earth. He planned to move away from the earth, from heaven. The pickaxe poem answers the question, who separated heaven and earth? It is not unthinkable to assume that heaven and earth were conceived together as a mountain whose base was the earth and whose peak was heaven, based on the first line of Catalan grain, Enlil was the air god. The Sumerian cosmogonic or creation concepts could be summarized after my research among available Sumerian texts had led me to these conclusions. The concepts explained the origin of the universe. The first step, the primordial sea came first. No mention is provided of its origin or birth, and it is not unlikely that the Sumerians believed it had existed forever. Second, heaven and earth were joined by the primeval sea. The third point, the male god, Anne, was created in human form, and the female, Ki, was conceived in human form. Enlil, the air god, was born of their union. For when Enlil the air god separated heaven from earth, he carried off his mother. Enlil's union with his mother on earth was the precursor to man, animals, plants and civilization. No direct explanation is given for the origin and nature of the luminous bodies, the sun, the planets and the stars. Because as far back as our written sources go, the Sumerians regarded the moon god, who went by the names Sin and Nana, as the son of the air god Enlil. It does not seem unreasonable to suggest that they saw the moon as a bright, air-like body fashioned from the atmosphere. As the sun god Utu and the Venus goddess Inanna are always referred to in the texts as children of the moon god. These luminous bodies were probably imagined as having come from the moon after the latter had been formed from the atmosphere. The big ones walk around the moon like wild oxen and the little ones that are scattered around the moon like grain are considered the rest of the planets and stars. We have a fascinating and very human myth surrounding the birth of the moon god Sin, which seems to have been devised to explain Sin's begetting and three deities who would spend their lives in the netherworld, rather than in the eastern sky, where the moon god deities dwelled. What is the myth's plot, and what is the newly discovered piece from Nippur? When the man was not yet created, and the city of Nippur was inhabited only by gods, its young man was the god Enlil, its young maiden was the goddess Ninlil, and its old woman was Ninhil's mother Nanbarshegunu. Having decided and heart to marry Ninlil to Enhil, the latter instructs her daughter, Women bathe in the pure river. Ninlil walk along the bank of the river Ninburdu. The brilliant-eyed, the lord, the bright-eyed, the great mountain, Father Enlil, the bright-eyed, will see you. The shepherd, he who decrees the fates, the bright-eyed will see you, will embrace you and kiss you. Enlil then calls his vizier, Nusku, and tells him about his desire for the lovely Ninlil. While sailing on the stream, Nusku brings up a boat, impregnating her with the moon god Sin. The gods are horrified by this immoral act, and although Enlil is their king, they seize him and banish him from the city. One of the few passages that shed some light on the organization and method of operation of the Pantheon is found here. Ninlil's private shrine, Kiur, is where Enlil wanders about, as Enlil wanders about in Kiur. The fifty great gods, the seven fate-decreeing gods, seize Enlil in the Kiur, saying, Get out of town, Enlil, you immoral one. Get out of the city, Nunamir, an epithet of Enlil. Thus Enlil departs toward the Sumerian Hades, following the fate decreed by the gods. Although now pregnant, Ninlil refuses to remain behind and follows Enlil to the netherworld. Enlil finds this disturbing since it would mean his son, Sin, initially destined to be in charge of the largest luminary body, the moon, would have to dwell in the dark, gloomy netherworld instead of the sky. Using a somewhat complex scheme, he circumvents this. From Nippur, the traveller meets three individuals, possibly minor deities. The gatekeeper, responsible for the entrance, the man of the netherworld, the river, and the boatman, the Sumerian Sharon, who ferries the dead to Hades. Why does Enlil do what he does? He takes the form of each of them as a substitute for their older brother, Sin, who is thus allowed to ascend to heaven. This is the first known example of divine metamorphosis. The following are a few relevant passages. It should be noted that the real meaning of several lines is still unclear, and that the significance of this part of the myth may ultimately change. Enlil followed the decree. Nunamir followed the decree. Enlil came. Ninlil followed. Nunamir entered. 
Nenlil entered. Enlil said to the gatekeeper, The gateman, the lockman, the boltman, the silver lockman, your queen has come. Do not inform her where I am if she asks about me. Ninlil tells the man of the gate, Man of the gate, the man of the lock, the man of the bolt, man of the precious lock, Enlil, your lord, whence? Enlil defends the man of the gate. My lord did not, the finest the fair, Enlil did not, the fairest the fair. This is what Enlil, the lord of all lands, has commanded me. Enlil is your lord, but I am your lady. I will touch your cheek if you are my lady. The seed of your lord, the all-bright seed, is in my womb. The seed of sin, the all-bright seed, is in my womb. Let my seed depart to the earth below, and let my lord's seed go to the heavens above. Enlil, impersonating the man of the gate, lay with her in the bedchamber and told her, I shall send my seed in my lord's stead to the earth below. After copulating with her, kissing her, Meslam Tyr is planted in her womb by him. The conversation takes place between Enhil, the man of the Netherworld River, and Ninlil at the Netherworld River, the Sumerian Styx. Enlil impregnating Ninlil with the seeds of the deity of the Netherworld, Ninazu, impersonates the man of the river. Afterward, Enlil and Ninlil proceed to the Sumerian Sharon station. In a third instance, Enlil impersonates the ferryman and impregnates Ninlil with the seed of a third deity whose name is destroyed. But he too will dwell in Hades. The myth concludes a brief eulogy to Enlil as the lord of abundance and prosperity, whose word is unalterable. Sumerian gods are anthropomorphic in this myth. In both form and deed, he is considered the most powerful human. As men, they planned and acted, ate and drank, married and raised families, maintained large households, and were addicted to human desires and weaknesses. In their view, truth and justice overtook falsehood and oppression. But their motive is unclear, and man rarely understands their motive. At least, when their presence was unnecessary for the particular cosmic entities over which they had been assigned, they were thought to live on the mountain of heaven and earth, the place where the sun rises. It is unclear how they travelled from one place to another. According to the data, the moon god travelled by boat, the sun god by chariot, or, according to another version, on foot, and the storm god by clouds. We do not know how the Sumerian gods were expected to arrive at their various temples and sanctuaries in summer, nor how they performed human activities like eating and drinking. Priests likely only saw the statues of the gods, which were probably handled and cared for with great care. Though the gods were immortal, they had to eat, could become ill to the point of death, fought, were wounded and killed. And could they be wounded and killed? A question that never came to the Sumerian thinkers was how the stone, wooden and metal objects had bone, muscle and life. Furthermore, they did not seem to be troubled by the inherent contradiction between immortality and anthropomorphism. Sumerian sages developed many theological notions to resolve the contradictions and inconsistencies inherent in polytheism. They never systematically recorded them according to the material, and we may never learn much about them. Many of the inconsistencies are unlikely to be resolved. They never thought about many questions that we thought of as troubling them, saved them from spiritual and intellectual frustration. In the 3rd millennium BC, the Sumerians possessed hundreds of gods, at least by name. The names of many of them are available to us not only from lists compiled in schools, but also from sacrifice lists unearthed in the last century. In each case, X represents a name of a deity. Examples include X is a shepherd, X has a great heart, the servant of X, the man of X, the beloved of X, X has given me, and so on. Many deities are secondary to the significant deities, i.e. they are the wives, children, and servants they were created for. Another possibility is that some are names or epithets of well-known deities who cannot be identified at the moment. Many deities were worshipped with sacrifices, adoration and prayer throughout the year. The heaven god Anu, the air god Enlil, the water god Enki, and the dominant mother goddess Ninhursag were the four most important deities. The four usually top god lists are often grouped, performing significant acts together. In divine meetings and banquets, they occupied the excellent seats. According to our sources, from about 2500 BC, the air god Enlil seems to have been the pantheon leader instead of the heaven god Anu. Anu had his chief seat of worship in Uruk, or as it is referred to in the Bible, Erech, 
a city that played a central role in the history of Sumer. A German expedition found hundreds of small clay tablets inscribed with semi-pictographic signs near the site of Uruk, not long prior to the Second World War. He continued to worship Sumer throughout the centuries, but his prominence declined. After the god Enlil gained most of his powers, he became a somewhat obscure figure in the pantheon and was rarely mentioned in the hymns and myths of later times. Enlil is the father of the gods, the king of heaven and earth, and all lands from the earliest intelligible records. Enlil was the most important deity in the Sumerian pantheon, who played a dominant role in rites, myths, and prayers. Kings and rulers boasted Enlil gave them the kingship of the land, who made the land prosperous, who gave them all the lands to conquer through their strength. Enlil spoke the king's name, handed him his scepter, and looked at him admiringly. We discover Enlil was regarded as a beneficent deity, responsible for planning and creating the most productive features of the cosmos from later myths and hymns. As the prototype for the agricultural implements used by man, he fashioned the pickaxe and plow. Throughout the land, there was plenty, prosperity, and abundance. This is the God who brought forth the day, who took pity on humans and laid the plans that brought forth seeds, plants, and trees from the earth. I intend to correct a misconception that has crept into practically all handbooks and encyclopedias dealing with Sumerian religion and culture, namely that Enlil was a violent and destructive storm god whose word and deed almost always brought nothing but bad luck. The main explanation for this confusion results from an archaeological accident. Sumerian compositions are characterized by a substantial proportion of the lamentation type, in which Enlil is tasked with carrying out the destruction and misfortune that the gods have decreed. Ancient scholars and later generations stigmatized him as a fierce and destructive deity. In the hymns and myths of Enlil, especially those published since 1930, we find him portrayed as a friendly, fatherly being who watches over the safety and well-being of all humans, particularly the Sumerians. During 1951 to 1952, while working at the Istanbul Museum of the Ancient Orient, I discovered the lower half of a four-column tablet whose upper half is at the University Museum in Philadelphia and published as early as 1919, late cuneiformist Stephen Langdon. A large fragment of the hymn was also found in 1952 in Nippur by the Mu Museum. In 1953, several fragments were pieced together to create one of the essential hymns to Enlil. Despite its incompleteness, the text's translation is not straightforward. Enlil begins with a paean to himself, especially as a god who punishes evildoers, glorying in his magnificent temple in Nippur, known as the Ekur, concluding with a poetic summary of civilization's debt to him. The following are some of the more understandable passages of the 170-line hymn. The Lord whose command is far-reaching, whose word is holy, the Lord who decrees are unchangeable, who forever decrees destiny. The lifting eye scans the land. On the white throne of Enlil, who sits broad on the white dawn, on the lofty days, whose lifted light searches all lands. The earth gods bow down in fear before the one who perfects the decrees of power, lordship, and princes. Heaven's gods bow down to him. Nippur, the city, its appearance is fearsome and exceptional. The unrighteous, the evil, the oppressor, the informant. He does not condone their evil, the vast net they spread, the arrogant, the agreement breaker. His meshes prevent the wicked from escaping. The shrine of Nippur, the mighty mountain, the dais of plenty, the echo that rises. A high mountain, a place of purity. Father Enlil, its prince, is the mighty mountain. Has seated himself on the echo dais, lofty shrine. The temple's divine laws, like the heavens, cannot be overturned. Its sacred rites, like the earth, cannot be broken. Its divine laws are like the laws of the abyss. Nobody can see them. Like heaven's zenith, its heart is like a distant shrine. Prayers are its words. Its utterances are prayers. Rituals are precious to it. Some feats flow with fat and milk, replete with abundance, storehouses full of happiness and joy. Enlil's house is a mountain of plenty. The echo 
the lapis lazuli house, the lofty abode, the inspiring one. It spreads its shadow over the land, its awe and dead are like the heavens, its loftiness reaches heaven's throne. The lords and princes present their gifts and offer prayers, supplications and petitions. The shepherd you look up to favorably, whom you have made high in the land, Enlil. Wherever he steps, he prostrates the foreign lands, soothing libations from all directions. The sacrifices of heavy booty have brought in the storehouse. He has directed his offerings in the lofty courtyards, and Enlil, the worthy shepherd, is always on the move. Bringing into being the princes of the king, the leading herdsman of all who breathes, the king. His head was crowned with the holy crown. No god dare look at him when he decrees the fates in his awesomeness. A command, a word of his heart, could only come from his exalted vizier, the chamberlain Nusku. Did he inform? Did he make known? He entrusted all the holy rules and laws to whom he commissioned to carry out his all-encompassing orders. Enlil, the majestic mountain, would not exist. Cities would never be built. Settlements would never be founded. Stalls would never be built. Sheepfolds would never be built. No king would be raised. No high priests would be born. Shepherds would not choose a ma priest or high priestess. Workers had neither a supervisor nor a controller. There would be no floodwaters in the rivers, and the sea's fish would not lay eggs in the cane brick. It would be impossible for the birds of heaven to make nests on the wide earth. Cloudless in heaven, plants and herbs would not flourish. Fields and meadows would not produce rich crops. There would be no produce on the trees planted in the mountain forest. 